This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Got another great guest from you for you today. He's from Florida. He owns parks in the Southeast. Excited to hear his story and kind of how he tackles different areas of the business. So please help me welcome my guest, Derek Vickers. Derek, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, absolutely, Ferd. I appreciate you having me on here, and I uh, hope to give some value to your listeners. I've actually been a listener of your podcast, and uh, you know, honored to be on here and hopefully uh, share some tips and tricks and um, with your listeners and people that uh, pay attention to your podcast regularly. All right, well, sounds good. Well, maybe give us a little more. How'd you get? In, how'd you get into the business? And how'd you? How'd you? How'd you come into this? You know, they they didn't have this on career day, at least at my school, to get into the mobile home park business. So we all somehow end up here. It appears, but uh, give us some of that background. Yeah, so they definitely don't talk about this in in career day. That's for sure. And so I got into the business in 2015 when I actually started. I'm like, oh, like guys that create wealth, they invest in assets and in real estate. So I started learning about multifamily investing. I started underwriting deals and things like that. But I didn't get into my first park deal until 2020. So I'll, I'll get to that. So I actually started learning about real estate then. And I was in the insurance business at the time. I had built that up. And so I had a team of about 100 salespeople under me. And it was 2020. And in March of 2020, you know, it happened. You know, the world shut down. And we sold insurance to businesses and so the the revenue went for, you know, it was like a third of what it actually, you know, we were getting killed. And um, I was like, all right, that was like the key to like, I got to get this real estate thing um, going. So I started looking, you know, more heavily for multifamily and then realized like, oh my God, in Orlando, it's 250 a door, 300 grand a door. Like, you know, the barrier to entry was very high. Yeah. And um, I, yeah, like crazy. And so I had a friend that had actually um, invested in some mobile home parks and he was like, hey, you should check out this asset class. So I started listening to, you know, some podcasts, doing some research on it and things like that and fell in love with the asset class. And so I, I started doing what I do best, which was cold calling because I did that in the insurance business and driving around, looking at properties and going on, knocking on people, you know, uh, park owners doors too and, and talking with them. And so I was looking at parks and kind of um, I'd met a guy that was actually in the business a little bit. So I was sending him deals and like, hey, what do you think of this deal and whatnot? But then he calls me one day out of the blue and is like, hey, I got a deal. My operating partner backed out. We're closing in seven days. Do you want in? I'm like, um, I'll call you back and, and I'll call you back tomorrow. And Ferd, I, I actually was like, what am I thinking, dude? Like, I'll just call him back now. Because I wanted to learn the business and, and get in. And so that's how we got in the first deal. And that deal was, I didn't get a chance to do any due diligence on the deal. And oh, so when God. I get in, get into the deal, you know, I had done uh, Frank and Day's camp like everyone else. And literally all the, you know, Frank's list of what not to do and what not to buy was this park. Oh, all park homes, private, you know, just a mess. Um, but that's how, how I got into the business. I know this is a long winded story, but you kind of have to hear all of it to get it. So do you still own that park? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. That's great. I sold my first park, but, uh, I kind of, you know, somewhat regret it, but it's like, you know, sometimes like, you, you know, sell one to pay for the next two kind of thing. And, uh, that's kind of how I tackled it. But so tell me about the park going homes. I know you own parks with a lot of park going homes. Some people won't touch them. Some people love them. Some people love that model and, and they love it. For new homes, they bring in and they rent them, kind of like a build for rent community. But if you're buying existing park-owned homes, oftentimes they're a mess. Oftentimes they're vacant. There are no titles. There's you know bad actors in there. Uh, what, what has been your experience with those? And do you do you prefer park-owned homes, or do you only buy them as a necessary component of the business, or for for pricing advantages? 
Yeah, so we actually prefer park-owned homes when we're going into the deal, and we actually convert them over to tenant-owned homes. So what we found in Florida and some of these really great markets, because we have parks, you know, they're Tampa addresses, Orlando addresses, like they're in the MSA, and we found that we could buy these parks that no one else wanted because there was, they were all park-owned homes and private utilities and things, which is, you know, an, another topic. Um, and we would actually go in and do a handyman special with all the vacant park-owned homes. And we would give people free lot rent for three or four months. And so give them the opportunity to come in and fix up the home. And so then we would actually convert all those over and get, you know, the new people would come in at market lot rent. Um, but, you know, coming with that, there's all kinds of bad actors in the park, like you said. We bought a park that was 70% vacant, dilapidated park-owned homes. You know, everything that you can think about was going on in this park. And so it was just, uh, you know, a big heavy lift. But generally, that's what we would do. We would go in and flip the park-owned homes over to tenant-owned homes. I'm curious. We've done we've done some of that as well. And in, for me, it's dependent on the market. But a lot of, in some markets, I give the same house away five times. Because the person gets in there and they're like, all right, I, I got sweat equity, I'll do it. And it's like, and they rip up the carpet and then they patch the wall and then sometimes they paint the wall and then they disappear, we get the home back. And then the next guy goes in and he fixes some of the wood rot on the windows and he runs out of money. And what I've, what I've tried to convey upon these folks is you can't sweat equity a furnace. You know, you can yeah. you can buy you can buy old cabinets sometimes at you know restore or something like that. But what I've found is a lot of these guys is once it gets come and you're in a warmer climate, so it's less important, I think. But once it comes winter time, they're like, yeah, the furnace is 22 years old. I'm not going to spend three or four grand on the next one. And then they say, here's the house back. So we, we've been very judicious about whether or not we want to give away handyman specials versus renovate it. What's been your experience, or do you have a feel for a percentage of them that come back? And has it changed in a, in, a, in Tampa? If it's so desirable. Do they stick there, but in a more rural area, they, they come back? What's been your experience? Yeah, and so I would, what you said is exactly right. It depends on the market. So in Tampa, like it's the, the, the demand in Tampa is is endless. So the people that we've brought in, they and some of them came back. Um, I would say maybe 10% of them, okay. 10%, 10%, so or maybe even less than that. Um, but generally, you know, we, we run background checks on people and people come in and it's typically, you know, a contractor who knows, you know, the friends have got a plumbing company, the other guy's got a roofing company, so they can come in and, and do the work, you know, sort of cheaply. But um, because we are in a good market, we were able to sell them fast to the right person. And, you know, we did have some people that defaulted or whatever, and that happens, but generally it didn't happen. And I think that's because the market's so strong. And I would tell, this is a great business model for that kind of market. If you're in a market, you know, a more rural market, you know, this business plan wouldn't necessarily work as well because we have a park in a smaller um, MSA than, you know, Tampa, Orlando, that the turn has been much, much, much slower because there is less demand, you know, someone comes in and we probably, most of this 10% is probably someone around this market. Some comes in the same thing and they realize, oh, this is a lot worse than I thought. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm going to give it back to you or whatnot. We buy it back or however that goes, but it's definitely market dependent on this particular, you know, strategy. Okay. Okay. Well, that's kind of consistent with my, my view on it. What about how do you test market demand? I mean, we all you mentioned the boot camp. We all know, you know, do a Facebook test ad, Craigslist test ad, things like that. What's in a, in a market like Tampa when you do that test ad? Are you getting a thousand phone calls or is it, is it, is it 200? Because I've got some markets where we got, I've had markets where we got 100 in the first hour and I have markets where I got 10 in the first 10 days. And if I get the 10 in 10 days, I generally want to bail or, you know, figure right. out what's the issue, what's the issue here? What, what kind of demand do you have in the, your markets? So if you put, so we actually had some park owned homes left in a, a little suburb north of Orlando. And so we put a test team, put a test stat out and we got like 400 responses on Facebook marketplace and in less than 48 hours. Wow. So that's huge, right? So it's massive, massive, massive demand. Um, and I'm like you, if I don't get that 
you know, that really thick and heavy demand, I, I run and I don't, I don't like it. But we generally would use just a Facebook marketplace ad. We would do, I like doing it, having them do an ad for home sale and lot rent. I also like them to do a rent to own ad because if we have some uh, park owned homes and they're in good shape and we can just put on rent to own or whatever, because um, that'll just give you an idea of what people are willing to pay. Because I was actually doing my podcast today on this, but talking about how it's just weird how, you know, if you just call put something rent to own, just the perception of it, someone will pay a lot more for that. And they're like <laughs> lot rent. No, I only pay, you know, 300 bucks a month for that, but rent to own in the same market, they'll pay a thousand. <laughs> Got it. Um, Interesting. So, you know, in Florida, I know that a big part of the MHP in Florida is the uh, that in your due diligence in your operation is the prospectus. And that's something that I don't think that exists in other states. You know, I think of prospectus in the terms of like buying Coca-Cola stock, but it's different prospectus as it pertains to manufactured housing. Can you give us the you know summary on what that what that entails and how that impacts your business relative to other states? Yeah. So it, look, you can still do pretty much whatever you want. It just makes it more difficult and there's more hoops that you have to jump through. And I will tell you, like, if you're, you know, an operator or, or a potential investor and you want to get into Florida and you're like, oh, Florida is a red state, you know, it's, you know, landlord friendly, I'm good. Well, not when it's tenant owned mobile homes, right? So it's right. hard. And so the, your, if, Eviction notices, you know, they require more time. The judges give more time. It's all stretched out and it takes longer. So if you have a guy who hasn't paid rent and let's just say he hasn't paid rent in three or four months and you file eviction on that person, it might be 60, 90, 120 days, depending on where you are in Florida, for you to get that person out, right? And even worse than that, let's just say you screw up on your background checks and you've let in a guy who's you know, doing illegal activities and things in the park and the place is a mess. He's got a mechanic shop outside. To evict that person for a rule violation, I don't even know if you can do it. Like it would take so long. So we <laughs> bought a park um, last year from a mom and pop owner. He was trying to evict um, a resident for a rule violation. And he had been going through this for like eight or nine months before we purchased the property. We got the property and it was probably not until four months after that till it got done. So it's a wow. year or more if you do that, because it's, it's, you know, it's crazy. And then as far as, you know, increasing rents and things, just tenants have more rights, which is good. You know, the tenants should have rights to, to do things. Um, and so it just, you can, you can increase the rent every year. You just have to jump through some more hoops. Your attorney's got to, you know, file some things with DBPR. And I don't know if you have any clients in Florida or have experienced that. It's just, it, it, it just makes things a little bit more difficult than it would be in a, in a different state. Yeah, we, we have lease, we have state specific lease packets for, we have about 30 states done. And I remember I worked on Florida a couple of years ago and it was, I was surprised. It was robust statutes that were MH specific in addition to landlord tenant uh, statutes. And then I go through it and I get to, not to get to the end, but through the process, I stumble upon this perspective. I'd never heard of it. You know, I never had a client down there yet. I never uh, owned, pro owned any property in Florida. And then I was like, wait a second, this is basically a, a supplement in some respects, a, a superseding document to the lease um, I think with 20 pads or more was the restriction. So if you had a really small park, it was a non-issue, but it, over the, my client had, I don't know how many pads it was, but I forgot, but it was more than 20. Like, oh, now you got to go through this whole other process. And then some of the parks have a prospectus. It's almost like a recorded easement or a recorded HOA rules or bylaws. There's like, here's this, is this comes with the land and the tenants have these rights. And in this case, in order to increase, and one of them I looked at, in order to increase the rent, you had to get permission from the tenants and you had to justify it via actual cost increases and you had to pull market comps. And this is like, oh man, this is a lot different than I was expecting. Um, right. So yeah, I knew I was unpleasantly surprised that Florida had more red tape than, than one would respect. One would expect you think it's really, you know, I hear it's a red state you know, stereotypically it means less red tape, but I think a big difference with Florida is there's a lot of people with money and a lot of retired people and those people vote. 
and those people yep. influence legislation. So they, and they protect their own. There's a lot of, you know, middle-class seniors in manufactured housing communities in Florida. So good for them. They, they have, you know, unionized, so to speak, and, you know, built up some restrictions. Yeah. 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 And it, it look, it doesn't mean you can't operate in Florida. You know, people do, it just makes it a little more difficult and you have to make sure that you have, you know, a good attorney that understands it, that can help you navigate those things. Yeah. Good point. So back on the, back on park owned homes. So do you guys, when you, we said, you say that you prefer them or you like them, is that only on vacant park owned homes that you're going to give away? Or do you also, if it's a, let's say it's a 1999 model, are you going to keep that and rent it? Or are you going to, are you going to sell it? Or are you going to dump it as fast as you can to get out of the home business? Um, yeah. And so actually this strategy has changed a little bit. And I was talking to my partners about this the other day, because we've seen in some markets and even, you know, in Tampa, Florida, people getting $2,000 a month for park owned home rent. It's like, okay, so Wow. You know, what, what What do you do there? That definitely begs the question, like, which business should you be in? Should you be in the park and home rental business? And I would say it, it would just depend on what market that you're in. We've generally, the parks that we bought are, you know, they were 60s, 70s, 80s models homes, like they were old. So we're definitely going to go in and, you know, turn those over because most of them are vacant and, you know, destroyed. But um, we haven't really bought a park with newer park owned homes, but it would definitely be a, a question of, you know, what you can get in rent and whether you keep it at, as a park owned home, because if you can get substantially more, you know, why not keep it as a park owned home if, you, if it's triple what you can get in lot rent? Yeah, I mean, it, makes, it can make some sense. We sometimes will, part of my calculus is how many park owned homes am I going to have in this market? And like we bought a small park in Des Moines and it came with five vacant park on homes. We decided we're going to rent zero of them because with only five, we couldn't afford to have a full-time maintenance guy. So we were going right. to have to call the professional plumber, the professional carpenter, you know, and it's going to be $150 an hour. And it's going to bleed, bleed us dry on that park on home rent versus in Kansas city. If I've got 50 park on homes, okay, well I have, two full-time maintenance guys and I'm paying them, you know, 18 to $20 an hour. Well, then they have, if there's a, you know, your toilet's leaking, Hey, go over there. It's 18 bucks done versus in Des Moines, you know, I don't have enough work to keep the full-time guy busy. So I can't afford to keep a you know full-time guy on the payroll. So then I got to call the plumber, boom, 150 bucks, you know, every time you want to do something, right. you know, or even just, Hey, this, the dishwasher broke, go pull it out and put in a new one. Well, you know, it's in, in a market where I've got a maintenance guy, Go to the store, buy one, bring it back, put it in. Problem solved. But in a different market, it's like, okay, uh, I can't get you the dishwasher today because I got to yeah. call a plumber and I, I don't give the plumber enough business to be high on the priority list. And I called five plumbers and I can get to you next Monday. And then, the, you know, the residents ticked off reasonably because the dishwasher or worse, the fridge or the stove doesn't work. So, or the, the furnace, you know, so that's been kind of my model is um, if there's, a, a nice, you know, grouping of park owned homes, then we are open to renting them, but we still try to rent um, less than 35% because that in particular for parks over 50 pads, because parks over 50 pads, you're eligible for Fannie Mae financing. Even though I heard at MHI recently, right. they're doing, they're doing less than 50 pads, which my rep had previously told me it's never happened, but one of the head, head uh, servicers indicated, no, they're, they're doing less than 50 pads for the right park. But yeah. my method has always been if it's over 50 pads, my goal is to get it refinanced with Fannie Mae. And they've given me the restriction of 35% maximum park owned homes. So, yeah, gotta be, you know, I've got a park in mid Missouri that it happened to come with like 35 occupied and none of them were rentals. Well, that gave me a lot of flexibility on the next 15 that I could rent a high percentage of those versus a park in Kansas City. It came with 22. Well, 10 of them were rentals. Well, I had, 70 more lots to fill i couldn't rent 60 of the 70 you know and i had to be here right, i couldn't even right. i couldn't even i couldn't even rent 35 percent of the 70 because i already had 50 percent of the underlying 22 so i was going to be over my ratio so it's you kind of be judicious where i didn't rent the doubles because the doubles can sell in a minute i rent the yeah. two bedroom two bath singles because those are harder to sell so I'll rent them to get the occupancy there but then i'll sell the three twos and sell the doubles so it's it's a 
it's a continual juggling match is, you know, as far as which ones you rent, which ones you sell, how do you price them? How do you market them, et cetera. But it sounds like you guys have some similar uh, methodology on if, if the juice is worth the squeeze and you can rent them for 2000 a month, then okay, we'll rent it. If it's the 1960 and it's going to be a maintenance headache, give it away. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've, you know, we've, our, our business model was generally to get rid of them all. Right. Until we've kind of seen here in the market recently about how much more you can get in park and home rent. And so it's definitely begged the question like, hey, moving forward, hey, we're going to move in some new homes here. Are we going to sell them or are we going to actually rent them out? And I think the answer is we're going to rent them out and, and see how that goes and it becomes a problem. You know, we, we can sell it and whatnot. But um you know, it's it's definitely interesting because everyone has been, you know, here in the last few years, you know, lot rent, lot rent, lot rent. But, you know, in some of these markets, like, you know, I was looking at parks in Louisiana or something where the lot rent's 150 bucks, but they're paying $900 in park and home rent. Like, yeah. what do you do in that situation? Like that, that um, you know, it's just an interesting concept um like the reverse business model that i've been thinking about versus what you know everyone in the industry is initially accustomed to doing no good point and i don't know if this is that just feels this next comment feels like a chicken egg situation is which comes first but i've seen a, a lot of our clients more and more are welcoming the park owned home model and then i've seen banks starting to finance park owned home income so now that I know, you know, I see banks are starting to finance some park owned home income. Well, I'm more likely to rent them, but I don't know if that's the chicken or the egg or if, because the, the, you know, I have some clients, I'm like, there's no way this deal is going to praise. So there's no way it's going right. to be finance, financeable, but you know, because it's, you know, it's a two cap on lot rent, but with all the park owned home rent, um, this is a, it's got a 20% cash on cash yield. Well, then the bank says, well, we'll right. underwrite the park, we'll underwrite the park owned homes. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm seeing more and more of that where I've, I've been more leery of getting too heavy on the park owned homes. Um, cause it, it limits your exit strategy. I've, I've always felt it will limit your exit strategy because there's a certain segment of the buying population that will not buy park owned home parks. And there's a certain segment of the banking industry in particular agency debt that would not finance park on home models, at least not for people, you know, of my size, you know, I know, you know, UMH, which is a large operator in REIT, they got to ring the, ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange because they financed a loan, a hundred percent POH and they got credit for the POH income. But, you know, I asked the lender to do that for me and they said, no, you know, so I mean, it's, it, it, it's one of those things, it's not, it's different, different opportunities based on different fact patterns. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think too, like, so think if you have a park owned home park with new homes and you're getting a substantial amount of rent and you go to Fannie and you're like, look like this. So they won't do it now, but I think in the future, they're going to be more, you know, amenable to that because of, I mean, it's a brand new home. Have you seen, you know, so you know what some of these new homes look like. Oh, yeah. They're really, really nice. And oh, really? You know, yeah. I mean, I think they have, it's really your, you know, your horizontal apartment complex then. And um, I think moving forward here in the next, you know, five years or so, I think we're definitely going to see that that percentage from them sort of, you know, decrease. Well, those were, they'll actually start looking at that more. And I hope they do. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think they will as well. I think they're going to be more and more open to park on home rents. They may put restrictions on it, like, will count the rent for any home 20 years or newer. Um, but they may not. They may just say, you know, and especially if they if they live up to what their stated goals are to increase affordable housing opportunities. Like if you let if you let me get some some good debt on park owned homes, I'm more likely to keep more of them. I'm more likely to bring in homes. And we all know it's easier to rent a house than to sell a house. You can yep. rent a, you could rent a house in a day, take you a week to sell it, you know, and maybe, maybe three weeks. Yeah. You know, so yeah. yeah, 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 and I mean, if they start counting this this park owned home rent, then you know, you look at some of these. I've seen some parks that are all park owned homes, that you know, the numbers are just you know crazy. They don't make sense, 
But if you count the park on home rent, if, you know, the bank will actually look at that and finance that, then, you know, it's, it doesn't look quite as crazy as uh, some of these numbers that, that I've been seeing. So, um, but again, you know, when I'm looking at a deal, I'm looking at an exit strategy. I want to get to Fannie. I want to get to Freddie debt, right? But if I'm buying those all park owned homes, even if they're new, I, you know, I've got to convert them over and they're not going to count that income. So, um, you know, so hopefully and I'm getting that is hopefully in the future that they start counting that more because I think there's going to be more opportunities out there for that kind of stuff. Yeah, agreed. Well, changing gears from park owned homes, what other tips or tricks or lessons learned that you want to share from, from your experience? Yeah, I think, you know, lessons learned, you know, we all start out with a, you know, a small due diligence list and it, you know, it, it grows over time. And, and I would just, you know, tell people the like, you know, private utilities, like you have to do so much due diligence on those things and you have to, you know, account for that. And if you're raising money, you got to account for that up, up front. If you have a well, you have a septic, if you have a wastewater treatment plant, like something's going to go wrong, right? Something's going to go wrong. Right. And if you have a well, so here, here's something. So we we're hooking a park in the city water and city sewer now, which we knew we had to do in the beginning, but we were actually going to look at just drilling a new well because it's substantially cheaper, but this park, the, you know, in the Florida special parks, I mean, they're so dense. You can't put a new well in because the setbacks of the rail tracks in the back and through the septic tanks and things. So you can't even install a, a new well. So if you didn't know that going in and you're like, okay, if the well goes out, we're just going to replace a new well. We're not going to hook the city water and sewer because it's going to be a half a million bucks. We can do a well for 50. Well, find out you can't do that. Yeah. What are you going to do? Then? And so, so no, my I, point is like, sorry, just take this stuff in, a, take account of this stuff up front. You know, hey, you're, you're going to have to drill a new well. You get a quote, it's 50 grand or whatever it is. You know, think about bringing that money in in the beginning, because you know it's better to have it up front than to have to call an investor and say, you know, you do a capital call to your to your investors and say, hey, we need more money. Right. Um, those are the worst calls. So you don't want to be you don't want to be making those calls. Oh, no, you you don't, and and especially um, you know getting into uh, your first deal like I somebody that um, had someone message me the other day they're like hey Derek oh my gosh I don't know what to do I got into this park you know we're 25 percent collected you know we're not making the debt payment we're on seller financing we're about about to default what do I do and you know getting down to the nitty-gritty of it like you can't like the operating capital that it takes to run these things, it, it's more than you think it's going to be. It just, it, it always is. These parks, they were developed in the 50s, 60s, 70s that, that we were buying in these markets. You know, the shelf life of the infrastructure, even if it's or, uh, public utilities, it's this old cast iron pipes, they break and break and break. And you, you got to account for that stuff. Um, so, so don't go easy on your CapEx, um, and your sources and uses when you're looking at that going into a deal. Yeah, good point. I mean, I had a construction guy one time tell me what ruins, what ruins the budget is not a missed price, but a missed price. Mm. So it's not being off by 20% on the things you thought about. It's being off by a hundred percent of the things you didn't. So in your example of well versus city, yeah, like, oh, cool. You know, it's not that the well went from 50 to 58. It's that it wasn't a well. It was a city connection at half a million. That's hard to come back from. I mean, it just, it just yeah. really is, you know, and, um, and I see, I see people make the mistake a lot. I see people make those mistakes uh, more frequently on seller finance deals because there's, there's no inspector or there's no appraiser. There's no banker helping you kick the tires. So seller finance deals right. could be great, but I caution my clients, like, why is the guy selling at seller finance? Maybe he's got a real right. good reason. He wants to, you know, spread out his payments for income tax purposes, but maybe it's because you're paying 2 million and nobody else would pay a million five that gets a bank loan. So you might be able to pay mm -hmm. it, or maybe it's because it, it, it has a, dirty phase one coming in on seller finance, you're less likely to pay for it. I see guys, especially a master lease option. Like, oh, I got a five-year option. And I'm like, did you get to phase one? Like, no, no, I'm not buying it for five years. 
Like, what happens four and a half years from now when you go to get it and <laughs> it's dirty? Oh yeah, you've already spent four and a half years of your life. So people cut corners like that on more often I see on seller finance. Um, and those deals often have hair in them. Maybe that's why it's maybe you're you're purposely seller financing it because you, it's only got 20% occupancy and you can't get a bank loan. Okay. Well, that, right. that, that, as long as you know, that's the reason you're seller financing it. Not, you know, not, not because you're overpaying for an asset. Yeah. And the phase one's what? 2,500 bucks, three grand. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can't imagine um, getting into something with, without, you know, taking that particular action. And, you know, to your point on seller financing, that's a great point. Like, the, what is the seller hiding? Because they're always hiding something. And look, look, these are great people. Look, they've been around. They've done great things for our country and whatnot. Like, they're they're business owners. But you know, the the facts are always you know hidden or twisted a little bit. You know, like you need to look at things and don't take the seller's word for it for various reasons. Because I've had sell, oh yeah, the wastewater plant's fine. You know, we did this repair and this repair and this repair. And then, you know, you check with the Department of Environmental Protection and there, you know, the flows are off and all this other stuff that they didn't tell you about. They've had a problem with flows for a while. You know, the pond is, is a mess. And, you know, that's another thing that I would tell people. You got to look, look yourself. Don't take whatever the seller tells you at face value. And I'm not saying that they're liars, but they want to sell their property. And so something they're going to make it sound a little better than it actually is. Yeah, agreed. We, we, we've been successful on several of our clients, seller finance docs, where we've been able to, uh, not say sneak in, but sneak in provisions that say in the event that um, infrastructure fails and we need to make repairments during repairs during the term of the loan. Any payments made for repairs will reduce the principal amount owed under the loan. Uh, mm. And some mm. sellers have agreed on that. So it's like, Hey, look, you told us there was no issues. We now have a hundred thousand dollar problem. We have to fix the problem. We did our $900,000 mortgage is now 800,000. So now I haven't had that mm. become, I haven't had the guy that actually happened where, yet where the guys fought it at, later in life. But I can, I can see that being an issue later in life when they're like, whoa, 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 you still owe me 900. But it's like, it's in the document. You know, we have proof we paid it. You know, yeah. we're, we're going we're gonna to win that win that battle. But I, but a lot of times sellers don't even read the loan docs. They just, okay, cool. Right. You know, or they'll hire a lawyer that also does speeding tickets and divorce. And that lawyer <laughs> is like, yeah, yeah, it looks like a loan doc. And I'm like, why did, how did they leave those provisions in there? I mean, th those are like the best competition for us because the seller is, comfortable because they have a lawyer but they hired a bad right. lawyer you know versus they do it themselves then you know they're generally more paranoid because and they, and they read them more closely because they're like well i don't have a lawyer watching i better read it closely and they're often smarter than their lawyer right and there's some of course, of course there are some that have competent lawyer competent legal counsel and they'll they'll respond like you serious you put that in there you know like we're like yeah we're not gonna agree to that we're like hey, it was worth a shot we, we literally in our, yeah. purchase, in our purchase contract i have like five provisions that are in there for two reasons. One, in case they just sign it as is, then we get lucky. These five provisions stayed in there. And the second reason is to test if they're represented by competent real estate legal counsel. Because competent, there's five provisions that every competent real estate lawyer will will no doubt redline away. Uh-huh. But and we and we'll cave because like yeah you're right it was it's totally unreasonable provision. But sometimes we'll find a speeding ticket lawyer <laughs> who will redline unrelated stuff and leave in these five and i'm like all right now we got more negotiating power on every other inch of the deal because they're lawyers mm -hmm. in conference mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's I, and i and i make my lawyers when we interview them they they, they redline our psa as a as a job exercise and i've had people that, I, yeah. that that's and if you, if you miss those five you're not getting hired i mean it's like these are not that hard um but anyway this is the, the pain the, the joys and pains of stealing the sellers yeah. and their lawyers I like that, man. That's uh, that that's clever. And I'll like I'll tell you the importance of getting an attorney that actually understands business and the nuances of MH, especially like we ran into some problems to where the titles of the park owned homes were an utter disaster. And our attorney that we had used prior didn't really pick that up. And, you know, the titling process, I mean, I think the the gray hair right there is from that. Oh, yeah. And, uh, 
you know, these are things that could have been prevented before closing or, you know, where we actually have some leverage on the seller. Hey, you need to get these things done before we close. So the titles are clean and that they they can be transferred over into our, our name. But um, yeah, like I, I cannot express that enough. And what you said is true. You need a competent attorney that understands not just real estate closings and transactions, MH specifically, because it's completely different. It's completely different. Yeah, yeah. can't agree more. <laughs> I'm biased, but I can't agree yeah, more. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is good stuff, Derek. Anything else you want to share before we jump? Or if not, uh, how can people find you? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not hard to find. You can find me on every social media platform, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok at Derek Vicker885. Um, you can go to the website at victoryrealestategroup.com. I did a uh, I did a webinar about a month ago on just some of the the basic terminology, the basic things that you need to understand to get into this business. And I've got a link and we can put that in the show notes, the free webinar replay that I did. So you should check that out. Um, and then just reach out. I mean, on social media, I mean, send me a message. If you have a question, love to chat with you and help in uh, any, any way I can. For All right, man. Sounds good. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, cool, man. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.